Here we're moving on to the second group of readings that we're taking from the second treatise of government. Oops, there we go. Um, so clearly we're not reading the, the rest of the treatise, but taking selections so that again, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we can get a fairly clear picture of what influence Locke had on the conceptualization of human rights. Now, um, one of the things that we'll notice as we go through this is that the drafters of the Declaration of Human Rights, they didn't pick up everything that Locke proposed in the Second Treatise. They're deeply influenced by it, that, that's certain, but there are, there are things that they did not fully endorse, fully take on board. So I'll, I'll flag some of those as we go. Now in chapter five, we saw first of all that uh, the introduction of money in the state of nature was revolutionary. Why? Because it allowed for this shift within the state of nature from the limited accumulation of property to unequal and unlimited accumulation of property. So much so that I put of twice. Also in chapter five, we find the introduction of this figure of the servant. Now the servant reappears in chapter seven. So let's get a grip on uh, who the servant is and what the nature of the servant is, because that becomes consequential for this idea of the accumulation of property. Locke in chapter five just mentions the servant as if the servant has appeared as if by nature, which is kind of his view. Uh, so he thinks that you, you get the establishment of the family with a man and a woman, uh, coming together, he imagines this as forming the unity of husband and wife and then having a child. This happens naturally, he thinks, and then he thinks that the next sort of natural step is the servant. Curious, it's not entirely clear how he gets there, but nonetheless, he does. So he thinks then that you have a free man makes himself a servant to another by selling him for a certain time the service he undertakes to do in exchange for wages he is to receive. It gives him, it, the master, but temporary power over him and no greater than what is contained in the contract between them. So this is an important development, right? We, we can see then that where uh, some kinds of contracts would have existed in the, pa in the past, say with the uh, implicit trust in money and the use of money to make fair exchanges, that that has a certain kind of contractual obligation. I'll give you this much money in exchange for this quantity of, of whatever it is you produce. But here we're seeing something that is impossible in the state of nature without money. And that is the forming of a contract to exchange labor for wages. So labor that Locke has conceptualized as this inalienable quality, a property in your body, is now something that you can contract to sell for money. So that there's a way then that money is um, disrupting the inherency of one's labor. To oneself, that now it is something that you can apparently exchange under contract, in this case, for a wage. He contrasts this, on the other hand, with slavery. So he acknowledges that slaves exist. Uh, slaves, by contrast, have no property and are not part of civil society. Uh, and, and in fact, there is, with slavery, a property relation between the master and the slave. 
So then the slave is going to be excluded from civil society, which again has the main function of preserving property. So all of the notions of preserving life and preserving health and well-being and, and property have now been condensed for Locke into the preservation of property, that this is the purpose of a political society or, or the creation of civil society. Now, it seems like there's something shifty going on, and uh, they have important implications for Locke's political theory. Now, we should recall then that in the state of nature before money, people acted rationally by mixing their labor with nature and taking the product as property, so that rationality has a certain kind of function here. Then, with money, people could accumulate more property than they could use, so that previously the limitation was that you could only claim as your own whatever you could mix your labor with and what wouldn't spoil before you could use it, with the proviso as well that you had to leave as much and as good for others. But with the introduction of money, now you have something that doesn't spoil, so those barriers to accumulation are lifted. And he, he has a workaround for the leaving as much and as good as well, so that people can uh, accumulate land to the exclusion of others. This means then some people are left without property. There's no land left for them to appropriate through their labor to themselves. There's not a, enough left. Rationality after money then is this different thing. After the introduction of money, rationality entailed the accumulation of property, not just the production of property through labor, which is what it was in the state of nature before the introduction of money. Now, some people's labor, the wage earner, the servant, becomes the property of those who could accumulate property, those with money enough to buy others' labor. And so now only the second group, those with property, exercise reason in Locke's view. This is a, a complete change in the landscape then. Political society exists now to protect property and requires that every one of its members has quit the state of nature and the powers of natural law contained. They've given up the freedoms that they had intrinsic to them in the state of nature for the securities that they get from entering into political society or civil society. They enter into this contractual arrangement with one another, contracting through law to get the security for their property that the state of nature leaves perilous. And in doing so, they have to give up that absolute freedom that they had before, constrained only by the law of nature. So then, now we live in a state of law that is not the law of the state of nature, but is the law of the contract made between consenting contractors. And importantly, it applies to everybody equally. There are, no, um, there are no exceptions to the law. And this is one of the reasons that he resists the idea of absolute monarchy. He thinks that with the absolute monarch, you have somebody exempt from law. And he says, no, that, that won't do. Everybody is subject to the law. Then the creation of these laws through legislative power, right? So that when you enter into the social contract, you uh, elect or appoint or agree upon legislators who will create the laws and modify them over time, presumably, that will characterize the civil society in which you live. 
So then the creation of these laws through legislative power within civil society requires the consent of the majority of the society's members. So it's a, it's a straightforward majority rule proposition that, that Locke is offering, that the majority of those who enter into this, the civil society contract with one another, they are the ones uh, who, by majority rule, generate the laws that will govern them. And yet it's not quite as simple as all that. Who are the majority or what is the group from which the majority takes its legitimate rule? Well, they're those who have reason. And what Locke means by that is that it's those who have property. So this is an interesting wrinkle, right? Now, not just everybody who falls under the law of the civil society is in a position to constitute a majority to set the law of that civil society. Only the propertied are eligible for this. And so then it's going to be only a majority of property holders who, in Locke's view, exercise reason and therefore can uh, generate the laws that will govern the, the society. He says, remember that in the state of nature before money, reason was a moral law. Quote, reason, which is that law, the, the state of nature, teaches all mankind who will but consult it that being all equal in, and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Now, the inclusion of the word ought here is significant. That is, that, that is a term with a moral quality to it. It is a moralizing term that you, by um, moral duty, ought not to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So then we have in the state of nature before money, reason is moral in nature. With money, something changes. On the one hand, we get inequality in property and politically, as it turns out. But with money, then reason becomes something else. Now reason takes on this instrumental quality. It's the ability to calculate, which is of course, essential for the accumulation of property. And in turn, that is the prerequisite for political enfranchisement. Locke doesn't say, but one of the implications then would be, uh, does this also imply that wage laborers, because they're propertyless, and therefore not exercising reason, and therefore not eligible to have a say in the legislature for the society, does that mean that because they lack reason, they've also ceased to be moral agents? It's not clear. It's not a topic he broaches. And yet it seems to be an important um, implication of the way that he has recast reason in this instrumental way after money and after the introduction of inequality. Whatever your answer to that, the majority now is the majority of people with property. Wage earners are not included in that group. And this is where things then get tricky. And as I say, shifty. Wage laborers are subject to political society's laws so that the law developed by the majority of property owners applies to wage laborers even though they have no say in developing it. And the reason that they have no say in developing it is because they don't have property. And of course, the laws are designed to protect property. So you can see how there's going to be this cyclical relation. Laws are developed to protect property by the propertied, therefore for the propertied, to maintain property in their hands, politically disenfranchising 
the wage laborers who don't have property but are subject to the laws that in turn are stacked against them accumulating property so that there's a way that there is a perpetuation of this division of those who have the political franchise and those who are excluded but subject to the laws of that political franchise. So as I say, not all of what Locke proposes here is picked up by the drafters of the Declaration of Human Rights. This aspect is one such aspect. So then we have this nagging question. What is the appeal of civil or political society to wage workers who have no property to protect in civil society and have no voice in establishing the laws that will apply to them only to protect their employer's property. So unlike slaves, they're part of civil society, but they don't get to shape the laws that govern it. He writes, government has no other end but the preservation of property. So again, as I say, there's this kind of uh, process of condensation where you start off with the protection of uh, life and uh, your your body, your health, your well-being, um, the value that you create by your labor in uh, property and mixing it with the natural world. All of that now has been condensed down just to property. So then government has no other end but the preservation of property, but under terms to which those with property consent. So then the only legitimate government is the government that has the consent of those it governs over with property. Doesn't require the consent of those without property. So then a further um, development of this notion is that for Locke, the just society is the one in which those with property and political representation get their political representation in proportion to the taxes that they contribute to the Commonwealth. So then the wealthier are even more politically enfranchised. They have a louder political voice than the less wealthy property owners and of course than the unpropertied wage workers. Uh, so this that is taken from a section that we didn't read, but I wanted to include it to get sort of the full ambit of his argument here. So then this aspect, political disenfranchisement of wage workers, isn't something that you find in the Declaration of Human Rights. So they, they're with Locke in terms of consent as the basis for legitimate rule. Uh, they're with Locke in terms of the people who are subject to laws get a voice in the formation of those laws so that nobody then is subject to laws to which they do not consent, or at least the process of arriving at those particular laws. Um, again, that, that's a, um, it's a principle that I think is inevitable once you recognize that Locke is advocating majority rule. So majority rule clearly implies that some minority is not going to get what it wants, but it has consented to the process of developing the particular laws that they will be subjected to. And so there's a, a way in which they still have consent to the system of generating laws, even though they don't necessarily get uh, the outcome that they wanted. Much, much like voting in elections. You don't always get the candidate that you wanted. One side wins, another side doesn't. But you um, endorse the system of arriving at how the leader will become a legitimate leader. Okay, so then um, what the Declaration does pick up and what uh, human rights advocates therefore do pick up is this notion of civil society as the protection against tyranny or against arbitrary rule. He says, 
to try and capture this sense, to ask how you may be guarded from harm or injury on that side where the strongest hand is to do it is presently the voice of faction and rebellion, as if when men quitting the state of nature entered into society, they agreed that all of them but one should be under the restraint of laws, but that he should still retain all the liberty of the state of nature increased with power and made licentious by impunity. That is to think that men are so foolish that they take care to avoid what mischiefs may be done them by polecats or foxes, but are content, nay, think it safety to be devoured by lions. So this is why he's saying that when men enter into contract for civil society, abandoning the state of nature to do so, because they're reasonable and they're exercising their reason in getting to this state, the idea of them electing something like an absolute monarch, someone who has all of the rights and privileges of the state of nature, but is unrestricted by the law of the social contract, says that, that there's no reasonable way to get there. That that is to abandon the state where they think they're at threat from polecats and foxes, so annoyances, but not particularly dangerous, and are content to be devoured by lions. The absolute monarch says, no, that's, that's not a reasonable expectation. You don't get to the absolute monarch or the, ab or the arbitrary ruler, the tyrant, the dictator. You don't get there through the course that he's charting out of reason and consent. The consent then makes one part of civil society uh, in two forms. So there's tacit consent when one has made no explicit expression of consent, but nonetheless enjoys any part of the dominions of any government. So you may remember last time I was saying, you know, there's, there's no moment in most people's lives. Naturalized citizens are going to be a different case, right? So that's different. But for those who are born into the U.S., let's say, into American society, there's no point at which you're asked explicitly to give your consent, but rather your consent is implied because you go on through your life enjoying the protections that the government offers you. And so... You're not required to give explicit consent. Now, it may be that there are circumstances that we could understand to be explicit consent. For example, as I said, when you vote, you could take that as an explicit endorsement of the system for arriving at just government. That would be one, one way. But um, the point for our purposes now is simply that there is this notion in Locke of tacit consent. So then this commit one, commits one to follow the law. You're under the obligations implied by the law through this tacit consent. But you can also leave the commonwealth. You can leave the society to which you've given tacit but not explicit consent. You can opt to go to a different society. Things are different with explicit consent. There, where you have explicitly endorsed the society, the civil society, the political society uh, to which you become a member, and this would be something more like the case with naturalization. There, with that overt expression of consent, you're bound to the Commonwealth permanently. It's a once-in, never-out kind of proposition. So that his idea there is that when you've committed yourself through your express consent to the civil society, you can't just leave whenever you like. Now you are, as it were, wedded to the society without any options of divorce. Uh, I mean, there are 
things like if the society should fall apart, then you're not bound by it anymore. But of course, that that's an obvious state of affairs because if the society has fallen apart, then the entity to which you've given your con consent no longer exists. So of course, then you can move on. But as long as that society remains, he's saying, you're committed to it. You can't change. Now, again, this is something that the Declaration does not endorse. It maintains the right of everyone to change nationality, to leave and come back to your society, but also just to leave and not come back and become a member of a different society, a different nation. So, as I say, we see that there are uh, ideas like consent that are uh, heartily endorsed, endorsed by advocates of human rights, but they don't go the whole way that Locke goes with this. Because it's not obvious that Locke's position is one to which, if you'll excuse the phrase, that you become locked into. That should you give your consent to become a citizen, let's say, of a particular nation, explicitly give your consent, that therefore you can never opt out and switch your allegiance to another society. It's not obvious that that's a principle that is... Um, that is inviolable. The drafters of the Declaration think that you can and you have the right to change your allegiance. Okay, so then Locke asks, why leave the state of nature at all, though? Why leave this situation in which you have these uh, nearly limitless rights bound only by the law of nature? Why would you leave that? Well, he says that a state in which everyone is a monarch unto him or herself and equally is also a state of insecurity, right? So that with the development of the civil society, you get this division of, of powers, legislative and executive, creators of the law and executors of the law. In the state of nature, those are bound into the single individual. Hence his phrase that in the state of nature, everyone is a monarch equally. So it is a state populated only by monarchs. And that that's what makes it insecure because he says then that uh, people will exercise their judicial and executive functions preferentially for themselves and somewhat laxly for others. Specifically, he says, it is not without reason that he seeks out and is willing to join in society with others who are already united or have a mind to unite for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates, which I call property. Right? Again, it's this idea of security in property being more valuable to the reasonable person than this unlimited liberty that brings with it the insecurity of your property. But the state of nature is lacking important things, right? So that we can understand these as motivators to form societies. First, an established settled, known law to which all consent, right? So then uh, the tyrant, for example, might have an established law that he or she keeps secret so that it can be enforced without those who are subject to it knowing what the law is, therefore not being sure when they violate it or when they don't, and who can therefore be punished at any time for virtually anything, because you don't know. You don't know when you're violating a law or not. This is a characteristic of some authoritarian states. 
and further then, this notion to which all consent. So then the tyrant once more will generate laws that are preferential for the tyrant to which rational subjects cannot consent because they're so disfavorable to them, or simply to which they have not consented that the tyrant has established the law without actually appealing to anyone else to legitimize that law through their consent. He or she just establishes it and that's that. Secondly, then, the state of nature is lacking a known and indifferent judge with the authority to settle disputes. Now, this is the problem that he's pointing to, right, is that in the state of nature, all judges are not indifferent. They all have a stake in the particular case of their own, trans, their own transgressions or when they've been transgressed against. And they're the ones who are adjudicating it. So then the state of late nature trades off this um, condition in which everyone is a monarch for a condition in which there are independent, indifferent judges, judges who are not um, predisposed to one side or the other, who also then have the authority by the consent of those who are before the judge to settle the dispute between the different parties. And then finally, following from that, the power to execute a sentence. So then in the state of nature, you might have right on your side but you might lack the might necessary to execute a sentence against somebody who has wronged you. The, civil, the state of civil society or the social contract resolves that problem. Why? Because it takes that power of settling disputes and executing sentences out of the hands of each individual and invests it in the society as a whole. So that when someone is wronged, even though he or she be weaker than the person who has wronged that individual, the appeal to the society as a whole allows a much larger, more powerful entity to be the one to execute the sentence. So that, at least in principle, no individual is stronger than the society as a whole. And as a result, everybody is going to be subject to the law. That's the idea. So then, in the state of nature, you have this freedom to do what you like within the law of nature and the power to punish violators of that law, or at least the legitimacy to punish violators of the law, even, even though, in fact, you might, as an individual, not have the necessary strength to do it. You yield these when you enter into political society. You give them up. You substitute society's law for the law of nature. And therefore, you relinquish the right to punish to the society as a whole, to the authorities to which everyone in the society consents. Political society, in turn, is obligated to govern, as he says, by establishing standing laws, so laws that um, are in existence, promulgated and known to the people by indifferent and upright judges who are to decide controversies by those law laws. So again, laws that everybody is involved, everybody with property is involved in generating to which all those involved in generating the laws consent that would be the legislative part, executed by impartial, indifferent, uninvested judges who determine the outcomes of cases in accordance with those laws, right? So that the law, of course, has to guide the judges in their decisions. And the, the judge just simply in a straightforward way decides in what way does the law apply in this case? And that's it. 
So the magistrate, the judge, may not usurp property, or the, the ruler, sorry, the ruler, may not usurp property. And to usurp pro property is tyrannical, right? Again, because usurpation implies a lack of consent to give over the property from the one from whom it is taken. So he says, tyranny is the exercise of power beyond right, which nobody can have a right to, axiomatically, right? That if, if you are exercising power beyond your right, you don't have a right to do that. Still, as long as the wronged party has access to the law as a remedy, then there's no justification for the resort to violence. So then he has scenarios in which uh, a leader becomes tyrannical through the usurpation of property. And then under those circumstances, if you no longer have access to the law to resolve that dispute, because the tyrant has blocked you from gaining access to the law or from applying it, the tyrant has exempted himself or herself from the law, then you are justified in rebellion, in the use of force to overthrow the tyrant. But as long as you have access to the law to resolve your dispute, to be compensated for the wrong that has been exercised against you by the magistrate, then you're not justified in rebelling. The law of the civil society still holds and because you are not in a state of nature, you can't take matters into your own hands and settle the dispute in the manner that appeals to you. Rather, you have to appeal to the law of the land and allow the law to work and to settle the dispute for you, to make you whole again, as it were, through the law rather than through rebellion. But when a magistrate's illegal action affects the majority of the people, directly or indirectly, and the majority is therefore unable to protect their property through law, that is, when the magistrate becomes a tyrant, then the majority is justified in overthrowing the government by force. So this is the condition in which rebellion is uh, legitimate. And you can see in the declaration, they don't put it like this. They don't say that these are the conditions under which rebellion and revolution by force are legitimate, but they say rather that we need the, that the people are entitled to the impartial law so as to keep rebellion from happening. So they're, they're turning the language slightly to say that rebellion against tyranny is a standing threat unless people have access to the law and the law applies equally to all. And that is a way of avoiding rebellion, avoiding revolution, avoiding just this reversion to the state of war. So then there, there's a way that the Declaration has taken up this lesson from Locke, but has approached it from a slightly different uh, vantage point. Locke does then outlaw, outline specific circumstances in which revolution is just. When the magistrate puts him or herself in a state of war with society, making rebellion necessary to protect the civil society. So you could again see that this is a kind of circumstance in which you have consented to a particular society, a particular social contract. The ruler has become a usurper and has become a tyrant. There's an argument there to say that the society to which you consented has in effect been stolen. It no longer exists in the form to which you consented to, the form to which you consented. So then, you are then entitled to use force to recover that social contract that has been taken from you, taken from you in the plural. And then you can restore the civil society 
to which you and your fellow contractors consent. Okay, so this brings us then to the end of Locke and to the end of the major figures uh, informing the notions of human rights that we find in the Declaration, that we find um, broadly practiced throughout the world from the time of the Declaration in, in 45 onward. Uh, 46? I think the drafting committee was formed in 45 and it took them a year. Someone can fact check me on that in any case. Um, and so from here, we'll, we're going to shift gears to start looking specifically at how anthropologists have approached questions of human rights, how anthropologists have studied them, some of the particular um, conundrums that anthropologists have found when trying to uh, make ethnographic sense of human rights, and then how they've responded to those conundrums in the future.